I like to say we save uh, the best for last, and uh, we feel very fortunate to have IBM here with us today. And uh, I promised Arvin that I would not give some long crescendoed um, introduction, so I will keep this short, but I will tell a personal story. So I come from an IBM household. Uh, my father worked for IBM. Uh, he just retired from IBM last year. He was there for over 20 years. Uh, my father is a software developer, and he wrote some patents on JavaScript, which I found out much later in life. So IBM acquired his entire software company so they could have those patents. Then he spent his career consulting um, mostly on JavaScript. Uh, so I have this certainly in my blood to be involved in the tech community. And when uh, we invited IBM to come here today, I was thrilled because of the history my family has with this company. And uh, we're, as a family, excited to see that IBM is taking leaps and bounds to get involved in the blockchain space. Certainly see a ton of opportunity. Um, but there's also a personal story here. So uh, uh, IBM has gone from my, my dinner table to now my blockchain table here in DC. Uh, so uh, Arvind Krishna is the Senior Vice President and Director of IBM Research. And um, his team is part uh, a key player in the Hyperledger project, which is one of the most successful open source projects at the Linux Foundation of all time. And, Arvind Krishna um, oversaw 44 lines of code that were donated uh, and um, uh, given to the, the Hyperledger project. Um, and uh, he oversees all blockchain initiatives for IBM as one of the leading tech companies in the world. We are thrilled to, ha we are thrilled to have you here today, Arvind, for your keynote address. So thank you. Thank you, Barry Ann. Um, thank you for a most uh, gracious introduction, both for IBM and myself. Um, so there's been a lot of talk today around permissioned, around private, around public, around use cases, etc. And first let me begin by telling you that we are truly, truly excited about blockchain and its uses at, um, uh, from our, coming from an IBM perspective. Our perspective is very much enterprise. We don't do anything business to consumer. Our clients do many things that are business to consumer, but we don't. So when I talk about use cases, it's primarily aimed at either governments or enterprises that tend to be large entities. We also, for most of our clients, they tend to be concerned about these things, these words that have been thrown around all day, know your customer, anti-money laundering. One that I found surprising that was not thrown around was FCPA or the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, because that puts a big onus on entities to know who you do business with. So when we talk about all that, um, it'll sort of come in in what I think about the use cases and when I think about permissioned. By the way, I'm not sure that we say permissioned is not public, but public may not be in Bitcoin, which, is, which does allow anonymity. So when you think about blockchain, and this has been talked about a lot, look, a lot of factors gave rise to it's this thing, because one thing which didn't come up is sort of why now, why not 20 years ago? Unlike many people, I'll tell you that I think that the computer science behind it has been around for almost 30 years, Maybe not all perfectly put together, but it has been. And that's something which maybe some people will take affront with, but, but I'll say it has been. However, um, uh, many people did talk about pieces that were not easy 30 years ago. And so sometimes timing is essential. The amount of compute you need, which I'll say kind of gets captured by the cloud. Um, when you think about the amount of distribution, which gets enabled by fast networking, when you think about the cryptography, when you think about all these pieces, they kind of come together, and all these words have been thrown out today. Distributed database, immutable, meaning that once something goes on, it's going to be almost impossible to take it off. I won't say impossible, because if you get national entities involved, they can probably put enough money, people, resource to do anything. And that's when sort of policies and uh, nation states get involved. Um, it is transparent, and that point has been talked about. Transparency, whether it comes to land records, which I thought Don made a great point of in the morning, which is the Honduras uh, example. And it is truly distributed, so meaning that there is no centralized control. So whether it's a millennial not wanting to trust a bank, the example just thrown out, right? Five years from now, millennials are going to be unbanked. I'm not sure they want to be unbanked. It's as much as they don't trust a given entity or they don't think their social practices or some practice is good which is kind of the reaction that you read about. So now that we have all of that and you get all of this, I want to be clear that when we talk about blockchain, we're kind of talking about three things. And it's not a value judgment on all the others who don't necessarily think about these things, but it is a point of view 
of what we will be bringing to market and how we think about use cases. So permission network or controlled membership. So that's a given for us. So any, any peer that comes on has to first go through a validation process of who they are. And whether that could be a paper process initially, because if you're really loading on big organizations, that's hardly a cost. You do it once. Or it has to be something which you accept through some other identity service. And our hope is actually to do both. So people can come on digitally, but they do have to uh, say who they are. And, and the consensus part is clear. I mean, uh, Sam talked about proof of work, and I think he was referring to 10 to the 16 operations uh, thereabouts. But uh, it has to have consensus so that this point about no central entity is, is valid. By the way, that applies even to a single enterprise. We know banks in Europe who have begun to use, I'll call them shadow chains inside, and they make sure that it's distributed so that no one department or no one entity inside can cause a problem. And lastly, uh, the immutability, which you've talked about. But that said, there have to be issues resolved. Because if somebody wants to go in and say, what transactions has Arvind done ever? I, don't, I can't really go backwards and go decrypt a whole uh, chain, which has billions and billions of entries. So there has to be some thought given to how you make this scalable and a 100-year ledger, et cetera. And we do refer to all those things. Um, Perian mentioned the Linux Foundation. And it's sort of come up only very, very briefly uh, today, so I do want to give them a lot of credit for what they have done. And so the Linux Foundation provides a governance around open source. So let me first say that. It means that all of us who participate in that agree to give up control, and it is the common consensus achieved through that. Uh, there were 30 odd who originally joined, um, uh, joined the company, as you can see there. And uh, they, at 2,300 inquiries, it was opened in December the 17th, if I Remember right? And so within two months, we got over 2,300 inquiries, which makes it at about five times, four times the fastest uh, open source project that they've ever dealt with. So that says a lot about the interest, or I'll call it the pull from the community, and the point about having some governance that allows for this fabric. When we think about the impressions, uh, and certainly for all the media folks in the back of the room, it gives me a good sense of what is the interest in the topic out in the wider public. I mean, uh, Jimmy referred to, hey, show Washington the money. I'll tell you something, that if you show Washington the public interest, that also has a slight impact, because that usually means votes at the end of the day. Um, I want to talk about some use cases that are quite different from what people have talked about and may address also one of the questions raised about state government. So the first use case that we get uh, really excited about is logistics. And by the way, you'll see some numbers at the bottom which are dramatically different than what a lot of the industry pundits are talking about. They talk about 8, 10, 20 billion. I'm thinking 300, 400, 500 billion as the size of this market. But I'll also explain what I mean by the size. First one in trade logistics. If anybody here has ever tried, let's suppose you're a, uh, you're a clothing store in New York City and you just decided to import some sweaters from China. You now got to go with a letter of credit to China because you certainly don't want to pay for the sweaters until they show up in your store, but the manufacturer there ain't going to trust you, right? You got a nice face, but that's not enough. So you carry a letter of credit. By the way, the letter of credit is an instrument invented at the time of Marco Polo. So we're talking the 14th century Venice banker. It hasn't substantially changed since then. And you guys think I'm joking. It has not substantially changed. So you go there with your letter of credit, and then that guy makes the sweaters, puts them on a local truck that goes to the port, customs looks at it, some shipping company, maybe Musk, maybe somebody else takes it, comes across a couple of these things, reaches uh, the United States, probably the port of New York in this case, it comes through the, off the ship, customs looks at it, they approve it, then it comes on a truck, then it goes there, the guy says finally, okay, I'm okay, and now you begin the paper trail going backwards for the money. You think about that step, there's 17 different entities involved. Why couldn't you put a contract on a blockchain and say, when a good of a certain weight crosses this point, two customs authorities approve it, money flows back from send, receiver's bank to sender's bank. And that's an easy thing. It puts together a lot of what we've been talking about here, about the transparency. And you'll say, now what does it achieve? Why does the world care? What it flow eases up is the flow of capital. Because what's tied up in a letter of credit is capital. The bank can only issue so many. And I will tell you that our estimates are that these things can flow up capital by 
And for the economists in the room, 10% increase in the flow of capital can make a dramatic impact on productivity and GDP. The second example, when you talk about property records, so housing is a clear example, right? Housing, mortgages, escrow, et cetera. Take another example which every state government uh, deals with. This is DC, so maybe not that many people drive a car, but probably some from other states do. So when you talk about a car, and you talk about leasing a car, you go from a manufacturer, and the state cares about that because they want the sales tax when that finally sells. You go to a dealer, and that, by the way, is a transfer of an asset. Then you go from a dealer to an individual who's leasing a car. Then, by the way, you involve a leasing company and a bank typically behind the leasing company because they don't have all the capital, and you have the DMV. Six different entities, and it takes you, if you're lucky, about two months to get your title in the mail. Why can't all this live off of a common ledger? By the way, that takes cost out of the state as well. Tremendous amount of cost out of uh, state government. Now, you again got to have transparency because you don't, want to, you don't want people committing fraud over there. All the taxation that's involved can be done automatically at that point to the point that was being made by the team. So it, really, really important use case. And a final use case is around capital markets. And I mean, uh, Blight talked about that to a point where that doesn't need to be addressed. Um, you see an interesting estimate for me at 300 billion. So it's not just the cost of the database. So the point being made in the last one, replace Oracle. Uh, believe me, I mean, we are no friend of Oracle. But despite all that, it's not just the little technology piece. What you're talking about is taking a whole business process, all of the labor around it, all of the friction around it, all of the flow of capital around it, and you look at that whole end to end, and you talk about going to simplify that. That's the size of the opportunity. And by the way, that is not that different than what the internet did when it took away intermediaries and sped up the flow of information. The internet didn't necessarily flow up the speed of capital. I think the analogy here is that these techniques now offer up the flow of capital increase in, in the same analogous way as the internet flared up uh, um, flowed information a lot faster. So when you go from there, but what are all the things you need? You can't talk about limits of uh, transactions. You can't talk about it taking tens of minutes to reach reconciliation. So you've got to go solve those things. You've got to worry about billions of transactions per day, not millions, and you've got to worry about doing all those in a way that is a 100-year ledger or better. You've got to talk about the immutability, and we've talked about proof of work. I kind of want to say you don't have to do that. The underlying computer science will tell you you can use various other forms of both consensus and cryptography to go achieve that without necessarily turning up lots and lots of uh, power plants or needing Arctic air. That, that whole system has its uses in a certain world, but if you take digital currency and cyber currency out of it, and you talk about that people create assets, and only they can create those assets, then you suddenly have a different need for how you go do all those things. The smart contracts has been talked about a lot, and I think my example around the trade finance would probably make that uh, much uh, clearer. And by the way, we at IBM are not the only ones doing that. I mean, certainly our uh, colleagues at Ethereum and others are also following uh, similar practices. Um, you know, the privacy and confidentiality. If I buy a car, only me and the manufacturer and the dealer and the state ought to know that. Nobody else on the blockchain needs to know that I bought that car. But the fact is the blockchain knows I did a transaction, and that's okay. For what purpose, at what value, that's nobody else's business. So putting in all those privacy and confidentiality things makes sense that the asset is not money, because money in the sense is money. I mean, like, uh, you, you're not hiding much other than the actual value. And you've got to be able to enable an ecosystem. In the Internet, people forgot. People didn't give a lot of credit, at least uh, today, to the fact that TCP IP was really, really easy for people to go use. And people could pick it up, literally, developers could pick it up how to use it in a day or less. And so creating that ease of use so that people can come on, learn the stuff in a day, get going, construct sample applications, help an enterprise go, is critical, I think, for the ecosystem that I think collectively we all want. And from my perspective, nobody's going to throw away the trillions of lines of code they've written. So if you can unlock and connect to that, but still enable the blockchain to get going, is a much, much easier starting point. And uh, we have put in, and we're going to put in more, all of the uh, help for the cryptography, the security, the encryption 
on the mainframe systems that do tend to run a lot of our large clients, especially in banking and government. Um, I'm going to give an example. So very few people here talked about applying block, blockchain inside their own enterprise. So we decided to eat our own dog food. We applied this to our, uh, to our one internal system, actually two, but I'm only going to talk about one. IBM finances a lot of the products it sells to our clients. And by the way, the clients, when they say that, they say, hey, I don't want to just finance the products you IBM sell. I'm, I'm buying other stuff from other vendors. I want that financed as well. Our financing network is $44 billion per year. It is global. Um, anybody we finance has to have appropriate credit. We don't quite finance uh, uh, people who can't show their credit. So it's a permissioned network by, by definition. And we have 4,000 suppliers and dealers in the network. The clients, of course, are a lot larger. And we do 2.9 million uh, total transactions. So reasonable size, I think you guys will agree. In that network today, we have 25,000 disputes. So a dispute is, hey, um, some, some dealer said, hey, I have a client order for something, and a supplier sent it. It got received, and then people say, I don't want to pay up. That's a dispute. Simple. So 25,000 disputes per year. Now, when you crawl under this, the nature of disputes will amaze you. Some people say, I'm not going to pay this because the tax rate is wrong. Why is the tax rate wrong? Well, you received the good in New Jersey, but you put a New York uh, tax rate. Or somebody will say, I didn't receive the goods that I ordered. So all of this is why, because there's a paper system today, right? Somebody does something in one system, then you go to a second, then you go to a third, then you go to a fourth, because of all the people involved. Suppliers, dealers, customers, us as the financiers, shipping companies in the middle, there's all these different systems. So we decided to build a common blockchain that all these things could live on. And we looked underneath and there were about 17 distinct things that had to happen, but about seven distinct systems. And uh, what you see kind of in this uh, uh, sped up movie of, uh, of the console of the system is that you see uh, lines going between suppliers and uh, dealers whenever a transaction happens. And then you see the uh, blocks coming on in the blockchain as a visual representation. And we just color them green, red, white. Green is, hey, it's all good. It's gone all the way through. I'm done. I don't need to ever look at that again. White, I'm in some holding state. Red, there's a dispute. Somebody doesn't like something. It turned out when we went under that and began to look into the disputes, we estimate that about 40% of these disputes can be solved automatically. To that question about coupling AI and cognitive methods onto this, or even simpler, just automation, just verifying it, that number will go up as we look more and more inside those. So when we look inside this, so today we estimate 40% of that can go away. <clears throat> and you say, well, what do I gain? Well, 40% of those uh, 25,000 disputes, that means your capital is tied up in each of those disputes because you can't free that up because we don't want to expend more than a certain amount of capital. Second, it takes on average over 40 days today to solve a dispute, which is people. So you take that out and uh, <clears throat> you uh, take the number to less than 10 days and you speed up the capital involved. That's a pretty good win for what I call one process in one Fortune 500 company in one country in the world, right? So when you think of the number of these processes, I haven't even hit our supply chain in this example. This is just our, our financing network. So, so as you begin to think about what it does, and uh, Jerry used the word shadow chain. If we had gone ahead and actually done all the invoicing and all those, you begin to hit a bunch of regulations. So in this case, what we did was a shadow chain. We left some of the financial systems in place but pumped all their transactions into a blockchain application that we built. So that's the meaning of shadow. So you use this to solve everything, but you let that be the audited system of record. Okay. So that's one great example. Trade finance. I mean, I talked about that example, and I think that that is one that's going to get embraced by various, various entities. When you think about shipping companies, transportation companies, uh, the $17 trillion dollars by the way, of uh, global trade that goes on, I think it has a great and wonderful example. I know we talked about remit remittances. I think remittances is about half a trillion dollars or something that goes on. Trade finance is about 20 times that amount. 
And it's an easier problem to solve because all the entities are going to be motivated to go solve it because each of them gets a reduction in cost. And increased capital means that all of them can begin to see their volumes go up. So that's a very, very interesting one. Um, some of you uh, will wonder, sort of, so what do we bring to the table? And uh, our clients ask us this. By the way, um, unlike what some people were saying, most of the clients we talk to actually want to understand the technology, and they want to understand the use case, and they want to understand the benefit. It's not or, or, or. It's actually and, and, and. And we discover that quite, uh, quite uh, early on. They, all of them also want to have their technical teams play around with the technology because they want to get comfortable with it. So the cryptography, we believe, is essential. It's not just a question of mining. It's not just a question of this thing. Um, this is a world in which I'll say there's good guys, there are bad guys, and the bad guys always try to beat the good guys. So you've got to be able to have the assets to be able to go improve on that as time goes on. I believe any given system that is static will get broken into at some point. So you've got to be able to go play on that. You've got to be able to go integrate with all the things that are inside the enterprise. No one's going to go throw away every existing process. It's just not true. You've got to worry about the hardware. I mean, uh, certainly in the Bitcoin world, people have used specialized hardware for mining for a long time. But as you go create all these enterprise uh, connections, and banks are going to talk about moving money, and enterprises are going to talk about leasing uh, goods. By the way, goods can sometimes be worth hundreds of millions of dollars. We talked about the DMV example of a car title. But if somebody's putting a large airplane title on something, they're going to be worried about how secure it is, it, is it and for how long, because those things go on for 20 and 30 years at a time. And uh, on the AI question, I'm convinced that putting AI techniques, both machine learning and other forms of AI, right to understand what's going on on the, on the blocks is going to be able to help dramatically as we go down the road. I mean, I'm convinced of that. And there's enough examples from the early work we have done. Um, when I look at some of the, this thing, so IBM does run a, pub, a public cloud, I'll call it. It's not a private cloud, it's a public cloud. Anybody can go in there. And we decided to make life easy for developers, two clicks. Go in there and you can stand up your own little uh, network, meaning your private network. But it's public in the sense that anybody you give an ID to can join it. And you can go around and play there, construct little apps, try to see what you can do, try to see if there's a benefit. And the goal for it is simply that. I mean, there's nothing else. This is not uh, something for fee. This is for free in order to get people going. And it's to get the ecosystem going. And it is connected to the uh, Hyperledger project. That's the code uh, that we run in there. And so uh, we also want to enable clients to be able to, large enterprise clients. So we can have something which we call a garage method. Come in there for two days and kind of play around, talk to our designers, talk to our business people, and walk out of there in two days with a, with a kind of a cookbook for what you could do to build your own application. And we have examples of people using blockchain internal to an enterprise, for example, to do compliance on various, um, usually on things that have money involved with them. So decisions being made inside, that's one kind. There are others who are working with a small set of external partners, and both kinds of examples are going on uh, today. A lot of the external ones are indeed around uh, securities, uh, settlements, and so forth. I already talked about what you can do on the cloud. And um, we really believe that uh, you're going to get a lot of uh, wins when you finally connect this to all the existing processes. So being able to call out, it's not just chain to chain, because that came up quite a bit today, and we absolutely agree. You're going to have a lot of things that go chain to chain. You're also going to have a lot of things that may go from an existing banking application or an existing corporate application into a chain and vice versa. You need to have the call outs in both directions. An example, uh, if I go back to my trading app uh, example, I want to send the money only when the U.S. Customs has agreed that this good can be imported without some um, uh, massive duty. How does the U.S. Customs decide that? They have a system that lives on a system called Kix, and, uh, which is a COBOL application for those who are old enough to remember. And that application can actually call out to a blockchain to say, yes, I got this information. So you can do that this way. So as we sort of near the end, why do I say it frees the, 
enterprise. Well, it eliminates paperwork because when you sort of say that I have proof of title to use that word in the chain, I don't need all the paperwork which you use today. Uh, somebody talked about the where's my title. Um, that was somebody <clears throat> on the last panel. And the 200 uh, per week. Well, you don't need a paper title if there is a proof on a, on a chain. You also want to get rid of these antiquated processes. Not just 20 and 30 and 40 year old, sometimes 600 year old processes that we're living with. And transparency. So, so when you look at all of that, I mean, it's my strong, strong view that uh, blockchain is going to offer up a way to go really free up all of these processes that we've been living with. And we've done a tremendous amount of work to go automate all the processes till today. But there's another, I think, order of magnitude you can get from able to rethink these processes because, and to use the word from the economist, because of the trust machine that a blockchain can engender. Thank you.